Welcome to What Problem Do You Solve? A new podcast from the New York City chapter of the National Speakers Association. I'm your host, Dr. Bruce Weinstein, the ethics guy, and I'm pleased to introduce you to an impressive group of dynamic speakers, trainers, and other thought leaders who may be able to help you solve a difficult problem in your professional or personal life. Our guest this episode is Jay Townsend, speechwriter, debate coach, marketing and advertising strategist. Jay Townsend has worked in four U.S. presidential campaigns, scores of U.S. Senate, gubernatorial, and congressional races, and a myriad of county, executive, mayoral, legislative, and judicial contests. He is the author of three books, So You Want to Run for Public Office, The Worst Mistakes Candidates Make, and Timeless Lessons from the 2016 Election. Townsend has received several national awards for his work, including the nation's best television commercial aired in a gubernatorial race, the best persuasion mail piece produced for a presidential campaign, and the nation's best newspaper ad for a political candidate. I will add that Jay was also the featured subject in a standalone interview for Forbes magazine conducted by yours truly, and he is currently the president of the New York City chapter of the National Speakers Association. And on top of that, a good guy. Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bruce. Nice to be here with you. Great to be here, too. Uh, Jay, what problem do you solve? Uh, it's very simple. I help candidates run for office. Uh, it is a complicated path, which I'll explain later in this podcast. So candidates face two problems at the outset. How do they become better at things only candidates can do, which is talk, campaign, and be great candidates and great interviewers? And how do they delegate to someone else things that other people can do, things that have to be done well, like their internet advertising, their television commercials, their radio commercials, mail, and however else they execute the campaign? I help candidates do both. I teach them to become better candidates with their words, and I take the, um, the burlap uh, sag of potatoes off their back when it comes to handling things that can be delegated so that they become better candidates and enjoy more success in a political campaign. So I understand you have five points for uh, potential candidates or actual candidates to live by to win. Well, yeah. I mean, a few years ago I sat down because, Bruce, I, I have worked with probably 350 different public figures in my time. And I got out a list. I just pulled out randomly about 100 of my files. And I began to look at those who won and what they had in common and... I came up with five things that the winners all tended to have. One is those who won had a very strong moral code. Second thing is they had a very crystal clear message about what they were going to do for the people in their jurisdiction. The third thing is they had a compelling story that convinced people that they meant what they said. The fourth thing is they did an excellent job of leveraging their network, starting with the people they knew well and expanding that group into a lot of people they didn't know at the beginning of the campaign. The fifth thing they had in common is they all had a good consultant, a good mentor, or a good coach. Because the trail of a political campaign can sometimes be very complicated and very treacherous. So, of all these things, that these are the things that the winners had in common. And when I looked at those who fell short, it was usually because they were missing one or two of these things that I call the key ingredients to success in a political campaign. So now, are these in decreasing order of importance, or are they equally important? Uh, they are all equally important, but it, it's hard to say, well, uh, I have no moral code, but the other four are just fine. So it's a little no, like I, Animal Farm. Uh, uh, they're, uh, all of those are equal, but some are more equal than others. It, and the first if, one... If it's missing, you're going to run into a problem. Okay. What is a moral code? 
That is, a moral code is one is they have a strong sense of integrity. They have certain boundaries they will not cross. They have a profound notion of right and wrong where they refuse to bend on something even if their voters are saying, we wish you'd bend on your position on that issue. Now, it can be very simple. I recall visiting a U.S. Senate candidate once in Connecticut. And during the course of our very first conversation, this is a middle-aged man with a family. I said, by the way, what, what is your thought about abortion? And he said, I don't know. You haven't polled it yet. And I knew that second that he and I would never work well together because you cannot be that old and not have any of your own thoughts about an issue that profound. I didn't particularly care what his answer was, but what, whether he was pro or anti on that issue, what I cared about is did he have, had he given any thought to something that profound? And when I saw in his answer, this guy is an empty vessel. So stop right there, because right. this is fascinating to me, because some political consultants um, would simply not work with someone who held a contrary point of view on abortion, let's say. Right. But if I understand you, it's not so much that the person is for or against it, but rather that uh, in this case, he was tied to the results of a poll, and that displayed, in your view, no integrity. I have my own standard for who I will and will not work with. If you come to me and you are running for good reasons, that you have compelling notions of right and wrong about what you want to do, if you come to me and said this is a problem that needs to be fixed for this jurisdiction, I do not care what your party is. I care that you have some unique ideas and original thoughts and something between your ears rather than some sloganeering political pablum that we're so used to. That's my standard. If you're like that, I will help you. So you if, would actually turn away business because the person did not pass this test of having a strong moral code. I do all the time. All right. So uh, not long ago, I was approached by someone who said, I, I need your help. And I did a little research before I talked to him. I found out he'd lied about college degrees. He claimed to have earned, but never did. And I called him and said, I'm sorry, we, we will not be able to work together because you don't have the level of integrity I expect. That seems to me to be a greater moral sin, if you will, than the first fellow, because in the second case, this is just out and out unethical behavior to lie on on, on an application. In the first case, this person is what Lucy would call uh, Charlie Brown, wishy-washy. Empty vessels, Empty what vessel. I call that. Empty vessels do not pass my smell test. People who fabricate or exaggerate or embellish their resumes, do not pass my smell test. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. If I get a sense that there's a problem with their moral code, <clears throat> I know what will happen during the course of the campaign. The voters will figure it out as well. And you cannot fix that in somebody if they don't come to you with a strong moral code. You've told me a couple of times about your grandfather and the KKK, and I think this story illustrates why you have such a strong moral code and where it came from. So mm -hmm. would you mind sharing with us? Well, well sure. Uh, my grandfather wanted to run for public office in the 1920s in the state of Indiana. It was uh, at a time when the Ku Klux Klan was very strong there. In fact, uh, the Ku Klux Klan controlled Indiana state government. And when my father, grandfather declared his candidacy, he shortly thereafter visited by some people who approached him in his barnyard and said, we can help you win, but you don't belong to the KKK, and if you want to win, you need to join the KKK. And he looked at him and said, gentlemen, do you notice this pitchfork in my hand? You need to get off my farm or I'm going to poke you right in the ass with it. He lost. But as he said to my father, the next day I got up and looked at myself in the mirror and I was proud of what I saw. Did the KKK retaliate in any other way? No, besides... they, they made sure he lost. But not with, uh, no. not, not that that's no. not a good thing, but um, no physical They probably violence. also knew that Grandpa owned several shotguns, so that they're going to leave the farm alone. But he was like that. And what year was this? In the 1920s, like 
that was the heyday of the KKK in the state of Indiana. Uh, they're, they're, it, they had very deep roots there. So. so those are some great stories that illustrate why uh, <coughs> point number one, having a strong moral code, is an important criterion for uh, a successful candidate. Right. What's number two and a story that illustrates that? Number two is a clear and compelling message. This is not so much as a story, but an absolute truth, and it's something I tell every client at the outset of a campaign. Voters do not care about you. They care about what you are going to do for them. When you run for office, it is incumbent upon you to tell voters what you're going to do for them that will improve their quality of life right or wrong, or correct an injustice, because otherwise, <clears throat> otherwise they'll assume you're just running for a paycheck and the health care that comes with it. So, and that message needs to be very clear, very specific, and you must be prepared to tell voters how you're going to do what you say you want to do. And that is as clear as I can make it. I see so many candidates who think they don't ever have to do that. And there is one story, I, I will tell you, it happened here in New York several years ago. Uh, there was a young lady named Kennedy, uh, part of the extended Kennedy family. And there was a vacancy in the U.S. Senate, and the governor apparently was considering appointing her to a vacant Senate seat. And for whatever reason, she agreed to do an interview before the governor had made their decision. And somebody uh, stuck a microphone in her face and said, well, if you got to be a senator, what would you want to do for New York? And she says, all I want to do is just serve the public because this is all about public service and my family and I have always believed in public service. Her answer was so idiotic that she ruined her chances of getting the appointment because when asked a simple question, she couldn't utter a single word about what she wanted to do for the people of New York. It was all about her. Wait a minute, because I, I thought you were telling a success story since she said, I'm here to serve. Is that not a good That is answer? not a good answer. It isn't? No. You got to tell people what you're going to. She was asked, what are you going to do for the people of New York? Oh, so she, she wasn't able to put any meat on the bone. She couldn't tell anybody other than, well, we're just we all believe in public service. Well, who doesn't? A lot of people don't. In oh. this day and age, they care about themselves. If, you, if you're thinking about running for the U.S. Senate, you have to have a coherent thought about why you want the job and what you're going to do with it. Man, if you can't answer that question, you need to go back to the drawing board. She had no business doing that interview without an answer like the that. The engineer and I are both running for cover because I think we're on the receiving end of your hostility. <laughs> I haven't done anything wrong. No, I, your question. I, well, I am well. emphatic <laughs> because I see so many candidates try and get away with that. And it's, it's a kamikaze thing that they do. You want to know why candidates fail is when they're asked why they're running and they don't have a coherent answer. That is fatal in a campaign. Did you work with this Ms. Kennedy? Did you work no. with her? No. So if you had, what would have been I a would better... have said, you're not doing inter interviews until we have figured out three reasons why you want this job and what you're going to do with this job if you get this job. And what might be an acceptable answer in those? She could have said, we've got health care that's a disaster. There are too many people who do not have access to affordable health care. We've got a transportation that is system that's falling apart. We've got to fix the mass transit system. We've got to fix this tunnel between New Jersey and Manhattan because it's a main economic artery of the entire Northeast. My God, Bruce, you could have given a hundred different answers to that question. Now, wait, I did not mention in your... Um introduction that you, in fact, were a candidate. You ran for the U.S. Senate and you were running against Chuck Schumer. Is that correct? That is correct. And how would you uh, assess your own uh, candidacy based on the five criteria that you provided? Uh, I ran short of money. There was nothing wrong with my moral code. There was nothing wrong with the message. But where I fell short was I did not have the network large enough 
and I didn't have a time to expand it to a point where it rivaled that of Chuck Schumer. Thus, Chuck Schumer was able to raise $26 million for that campaign. He spent $18 million of it uh, in his campaign, so I was outspent <laughs> like 18 to 1. Where I fell short is I didn't have the network of donors that he had. So enough, enough people did not hear your message. Right. Or it was drowned out by... It was drowned out by his advertising. Yeah. And you think, well, had the shoe been on the other foot, you had more money, you believe you would have won. Uh, it, it was a, a year in which I could have won. The environment was right. Uh, we kept him on the defensive on a lot of things during the campaign that I really didn't want to answer for. But I did not have the network of donors that I needed to sustain the campaign at a level that it needed to be waged. Hmm. Right. Point number three. Uh, when I tell candidates you need to tell your story, uh, to many of them, all that means is they're supposed to get up and recite their resume. That is not what that means. This is what it means to tell your story. It's about the time in your life when you saw something or heard something or experienced something that changed the way you think or changed the way you behaved or something that changed your journey. One of those come to Jesus moments where you saw something that altered the way you feel about certain things uh, because here's the fact. What you think today, Bruce, is not what you thought perhaps five or ten years ago. Who you are today, you were not born with those thoughts in your head. You're not born with the attitudes that you have right now. They're a product of your life experiences. I, as a voter, need to hear what makes you tick. Why do you feel the way you do? Why are you running for this job advocating the things that you do? Something in your background explains that. It's what I call peeling back your onion. Voters need to see the real you. When someone tells their story about a key moment in their life that made them care about public education or led them to believe that we need to alter immigration laws in a certain way or a that uh, health care should be accessible for, for all, perhaps a daughter who died of cancer or, or a family wiped out in bankruptcy because of a medical bill, then I better understand. And furthermore, if I hear that story and hear why you're running, I'm inclined to trust that you really mean what you say. So help me to understand this, Jay. Every year, the Gallup organization surveys Americans and asks them, uh, how favorably do you view the following 25 industries? Mm -hmm. Last fall, at the top of the heap were the grocery industry, uh, the computer industry, and um, restaurants. Mm -hmm. Second from the bottom, <clears throat> year after year, members of Congress. Sure. Why? Why are members of Congress viewed so unfavorably when what you're talking about is uh, something that uh, if taken seriously, would put that to the top of the heap. Uh, the problem with our Congress has started over the last 20 years. Uh, too many of them are not, they go there to fix problems, and after they get there, their objective becomes not problem solving, but staying in the position. And they bend themselves into pretzels. They look for ways to get out of making difficult decisions. They delegate their authority to the executive branch. They create yet another agency to make difficult decisions they don't want to make. All with the idea that if I don't make any decisions, I don't piss anybody off, and I can always run against the bureaucrats that made the decisions I did not want to make and it's poisoned the institution. It is now filled with a lot of clowns who are not there to solve problems. They're there to spew hate and sow division. Now, let's take one example we can all understand. Do you know when the last 
war was declared by uh, by the United States Congress. World War II. World War II. How many wars have we? This was fought? not a plan, uh, ladies and gentlemen listening. I I I knew that. Okay. How many wars have been fought since then? Uh, well, undeclared with Korea. Well, actually, Korea is, is not technically a war, right? It's a well, we, skirmish. We did, we did fight a war it, it, in Vietnam and then, Afghan, uh, Afghanistan. And, yeah, but here's what look at what's happened in the last 20 years. We have now, now fought two of the longest wars ever fought by the United States of America. We can't seem to get out of them. Did Congress declare war against Afghanistan? Or against Iraq? No. No. Those Why? were unilateral decisions by the president. Because Congress allowed it. Because they didn't want to make a difficult decision. Now, actually, uh, I, I beg to differ. In uh, 2003, there was a great hue and cry in Congress about not being uh, given the... It was over uh, the funding. Right, but Congress did not declare war against Iraq. No, but they were upset. Uh, many people in Congress were upset, if I recall correctly, that... Uh, they were not given the opportunity to vote on it. That's their fault. Who controls the purse strings that funds the war? The United States Congress and only the United States Congress. In fact, the Constitution of the United States delegates to Congress the power to declare war. Well, I want to know why um, more people, more good people, more people who would take those five points seriously are not even putting their hats in the ring. Uh, the truth is that uh, in this day and age, uh, our politics, uh, well, it's easier to get into the political marketplace now than it's ever been. Ben. Because of social media? Yeah, because social, it's, a, it's a great innovation that has allowed ill-funded people to disseminate a message that actually resulted in uh, a movement. On the other hand, Doing this has become so ungodly complicated sometimes. Uh, we try and make this as simple as we can, but uh, Bruce, I, I will we say- We being your consulting agency. Uh, yeah, right. and me, all right, but uh, Bruce, the first thing someone would do if you made known that you were going to run for Congress is they would dig up everything that you've ever said, everything that you have ever done. They would do a complete and total background on you. And that's why you. I don't want to run for office. Well, and that's what Who could withstand that kind of scrutiny? Uh, people who are so committed to a cause that they're willing to take the brick bats to fight for the cause regardless of the potential damage done to their reputation. So that's who we have. The, the people running now are the, those people, those high-minded, courageous people who are willing to take the brick bats. Those are the kind of people I work for, Bruce. They've got a cause they want to promote. They've got a movement they want to create. They've got a problem that they want to fix. And they're courageous enough to say, go ahead and shoot at me. I care so much about this. I don't care. I wonder if the people who say that are able to say that because they have not been on the receiving end of the trolls on the Internet and the hatred and uh, the, the vitriol that's out there on the Internet and, and Twitter and Facebook. If you believe in your cause, you'll take it. You will. If you believe passionately in your cause, you will endure that to advance your cause. So I, I Frank Bruce, my business is booming. I, I, not a day goes by that someone doesn't call me or email me to ask that I, I help them. From around the world, as I understand it's, it. Yeah, it's all, in fact, I started my day with a client in Australia. I wish in, you were less successful in a way because you and I used to go for nice walks on <laughs> the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and that's all uh, been 86 because you're in such demand. Uh, yes, I'm working seven days a week now. All right, but but, to, but to, I just wanted to show the other side of Jay Towns, and I think people seeing you, hearing you, might be surprised to know that one of the ways you relax is hot yoga. Yes, I do that. But this this is not a punishment because you're check bounced. You you choose to do this. I choose to do. I that. don't understand this. You don't hot yoga. For one thing, I can never. Every time I'm doing the downward dog, they're on to the next thing, and I'm always behind, and I feel it's just so anxiety producing. I, okay. I can't do. It. But also then the hot part. All right. Well, it's 110 degrees or something in human? Uh, it can be 105. But oh, well, I can handle that. Bruce, think of it this way. <laughs> 
I tell my clients, they're going to shoot at you. You got to get up and you got to take it in the name of the cause that you hope to advance. Part of the reason I go to hot yoga is simply this. 60 minutes into a 90-minute session, when you are so drained and so dehydrated and so ready to sit down and not do anymore, I keep going. I refuse to quit. It is a draining physical experience to go through that for 90 straight minutes in 105 degree heat. It tests my endurance. That sounds like most of the dates I had before I got married. <laughs> and it was a lot more expensive than hot yoga, I can tell you that, but I digress. Hmm. Uh, we've done the first three of your five points, correct? Yes. Point number four. Uh, when I say leverage your network, here is an unvarnished... Leverage your network. Leverage your network. Here's an unvarnished truth. Nobody is ever elected to anything without the help of someone else. And your help is at your fingertips, and all you need to do is open up your phone and start going through your contact list and start looking for the names of people who might help you in some way. Some because they're very bright and they can advise you on an issue. Some because maybe they've got a fat checkbook and they can write a check to you. Some because they don't have any money but they can go door to door for you or answer a phone at a campaign headquarters. From that network, that you have in your phone, people you know, people you went to school with, people you've worked with, people you served with in charitable and civic organizations. All of those people that you know, know people you don't know. And that's the way you start with a small network and make it grow. And I'm gonna give you one illustration of how I saw this work. Uh, about a year ago, someone called me and he, he introduced me. He was out of the blue. He says, um, I, I live in this pretty good sized city in southern Illinois, and I've really never been involved in party politics here, but this city is on its knees and it needs some help, and I think I can bring it back, but I don't know anything about politics. Uh, I don't know how to do this. Can you help me? And we put together a masterful speech. It had a compelling story about what he had done when he was involved with uh, education and the kids in that community. And since he didn't know any of the political players, I just said, why don't we do a public announcement? And he invited 400 people to come hear him give an announcement speech in the middle of the day. And of course, it was a command performance. He did a masterful job with it. At that announcement speech, 398 people signed the volunteer card. People pulled out their credit cards, offering to give him money. People walked away with yard signs to put in their front yard. They were so moved by what they saw that they began to talk to other people about why this guy ought to be mayor. We put that video of his announcement speech 20 minutes long on Facebook, and within three weeks it had been viewed 20,000 times. It was so powerful. Hmm. That is a, an example of someone who took an existing network and turned it into a coalition. By the way, he ran against an incumbent mayor and was elected in a landslide six months later. Very nice. Yeah. Congratulations. Okay. Point number five. Point number five. If you and I were standing at the base of Mount Everest and I was a guide and you were standing there and you pointed to the top of Mount Everest and said, I want to go up there. I would not say to you, well, put on a pair of shoes and take off. I would not say to you, um, well, if you go with me, you got a better chance. What I would say to you is, Bruce, there are certain things that you must do to prepare for this journey before 
you go. And once you're prepared for it, if you want me to go with you, we'll, we'll talk about that. Because what's going to happen as you get up the mountain, Bruce, is you're going to, you may get stuck out there after dark before you got your tent pitched. There are storms that can come up that are not your fault, but they can be mean and nasty and a high velocity, and it can be 20 and 30 below zero. And if you get up there on those treacherous trails covered with ice on these sharp rocks, and you don't have a guide there to help you navigate your journey, the chances are you getting up there are practically nil. The chances that you're going to get hurt in route to the top are extreme. Everybody in this line of work needs a coach because it's like in a competitive political campaign, it's like walking through a minefield. No consultant can foresee everything that you might encounter on the campaign trail, but what we do bring to the campaign is knowledge about how to handle things that inevitably do happen on the campaign trail. Plus, we're wise enough in this business as, as we've worked with candidates. We intrinsically understand you need time to be the best candidate. You can be doing those things that only you can do. You as a candidate need to be well rested. You as a candidate need to be prepared before you do a television or a radio or a newspaper interview. There is an art to coming out on top in a debate, particularly as we saw last week with very well-funded candidate who did not do very well. You know what? He learned the hard way. Those debates make a difference. Well, we'll see in a few hours we'll uh, how he in does in number two. Yeah, we will. But here's the point. You have to be the great candidate. You need help staying on top of those things that only you can do. Uh, uh, you need to be prepared for these interviews. You need to be prepared for these debates. And you need help managing all of those things that you don't know have to do, don't know how to do, because somebody else can do a great job putting your ads together and putting out your social media, advertising on Facebook, and filing your reports and keeping you legal. You have no business getting involved with that, but you do have a business of somebody who's a professional that knows how to put together a competent staff to do that for you. You cannot do all of this by yourself, Bruce. It's the one thing, oh my God, if you're gonna run for office, get some help, because otherwise you will run into things that you do not know to handle. You will get thrown off course, concentrating on things that are not important at the expense of things that are. are. You'll tackle a project that is not urgent at the expense of something that is urgent. What's one question I did not ask you that you would like to answer? that I would like to answer, why do I do what I do? How much time we got, Bruce? Not much. Not much, okay. Um, we're on the 22nd floor of mm, uh, right. this building and we're going down to the ground floor. All right, it's because of something that happened when I was 13 years old. I turned on the TV one night and I, it was the day that Martin Luther King had been killed and most cities in America were on fire and burning and looting and rioting. And Robert Kennedy was campaigning for president in the city of Indianapolis. And he'd been told by the mayor, we can't protect your safety. Do not go out. Go to your hotel room and lock the door, please. And Kennedy said, no, I'm going to go to the ghetto of Indianapolis and I'm going to meet with some people in pain. And he got there and there was a humongous crowd and he mounted the back of a flatbed truck. And he told them that Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And he said, I know you're angry and you have a right to be angry and I know it hurts and I know there's pain. But I'm gonna ask that you not do what some of your brothers and sisters are doing tonight. Don't go burn businesses. Don't loot, don't riot. I'm gonna ask that you honor Dr. King the way Dr. King would want to be honored. 
that you celebrate what he had achieved and that you join hands and go to your homes and churches to pray and honor him the way he would like to be remembered. Bruce, there was no violence that night in the city of Indianapolis, the only major city in America where there was none. I didn't realize it at the time, but I later came to realize that what I had seen in that moment was the power of words to change the course of an entire city. And that was my first hint, that the greatest power in this world comes from helping people fashion the words that they say. I have been near the citadel of power my entire life. My words have affected elections, and the greatest joys I have ever known have come from helping good people win elections and do great things for people in their jurisdiction. Last question. Sure. The hardest one of all. Mm -hmm. I always leave it for the end because it is going to require some thought. What are some of your favorite films? My favorite films are those who had interesting stories. I got a, The Godfather was a great story. Uh, Munich was a great story. Uh, Margin Call was a great story. Uh, I've seen thousands of movies. It's one of my favorite pastime movies and documentaries. But the most powerful, the ones I remember well, are those that had a real story of good and evil, and villains, and pain. They had real heroes that had tragedy. I don't know if you're yeah. talking about The Godfather or the modern political landscape, but uh, I think well, there's some there parallels. Well, there are similarities there. between The Godfather yes. and politics. There are. Uh, we don't uh, use uh, guns and bullets in politics, but I got to tell you that words and pictures and symbols can be just as lethal as guns and bullets. It is used in our civilized warfare we Tweets. call politics. Yeah. Facebook posts. Yeah. Jay Townsend, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you, sir. Been a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be here.